Hello everyone, my name is Clancis and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. I am back with another true crime story and today's case takes us to Cape Town, Johannesburg, somewhere in the Eastern Cape and back to Johannesburg. And it is the bizarre murder of the Causa family. Vusi Ernest Mabaso was born in 1994. Unfortunately, I could not find his full birthday. I looked, trust me. So he was born in Cape Town and there's no further background information about him. All we know it was just him and his mother. So it was said that around Cape Town or people whispering that actually Ernest Mabaso and his mother are not South Africans. Actually, they come from Zimbabwe. So they came to South Africa in the early 90s to look for greener pastures. So when they arrived in South Africa, supposedly from Zimbabwe, they settled in a township called Kailicha in Cape Town. So Ernest grew up in abject poverty. His mother could not necessarily take care of him, let alone feed him, because all the jobs that she tried to find were short-lived or she was not getting paid enough in order to take care of her son. Ernest always wanted to know about his father. His mother would always tell him that, oh, your father is in Johannesburg. So sometimes he would think about, maybe I should go and find my father in Johannesburg. So at this stage, Ernest Mabaso is in his mid-teens. So because Ernest's mother could not take care of him, so she decided to take Ernest to one of her family members who lived not far away in Kailicha. Now, this family that his mother took him to, they are relatives of some sort. I could not find exactly how they were related. I'm suspecting is either the brother or the sister of the mother because uh, they took Ernest in. The reason why they took Ernest in is because he was already grown up, he was going to school, he was not a problem child, he enjoyed school and he performed really well at school. So this particular family member did not have a problem with Ernest per se, so that is why they took him in. Now this family was well off, they were not rich, but they were comfortable enough to take Ernest in and bring him up while his mother tried to sort herself out. So not long after Ernest has settled in with his new family when a family member who is a male started molesting Ernest. Not only was he molesting Ernest but he was also physically abusing Ernest. I'm supposing it's either an older son of the family or the father of the family that was doing this to Ernest in his new setting. So he decided to run away, but he did not run away to the streets. He decided to go to the police and report the molestation as well as the physical abuse that he was enduring in this family. So the police, instead of going to arrest this man that was that was abusing and molesting uh, Ernest, they decided to call the social worker. I understand why the police called the social worker because the best interest of a child in South Africa rests with the high court and social workers work hand in hand with high courts where a child or where a minor child is in trouble so the social worker did come and started interviewing Ernest to make sure that the story he was telling it was not a fib or a way of getting back to an adult that he may have not been I seeing eye to eye with they wanted basically the social worker wanted to see and hear the, the authenticity of the story that also included medical examinations and indeed, Ernest Mabaso was telling the truth. He was being molested as well as being physically abused. And as a result, the social worker did not take Ernest back to the family. Instead, she placed him in an orphanage, which was not too far away from the township of Kailicha. So I did try to check what had happened to the man that was molesting and physically abusing Ernest. Unfortunately, I could not find any information about his arrest, his prosecution, as well as conviction. So it sounds as though it was just something that uh, kind of like disappeared into thin air because Ernest Mabaso was then placed in an orphanage. Immediately he started settling into the orphanage. He was taken to a school that was working with the orphanage. So meaning that the orphanage 
any child that goes to the orphanage there are various schools that the orphanage worked with so that if they receive a child the child is placed in if the child is in high school there's a particular high school that the child will be taken to if it's a primary school the child will be taken to that particular primary school that works hand in hand with the orphanage because Ernest Mabaso was already in grade 11 so he was taken to high school in high school Ernest Mabaso was thriving he was intelligent everybody liked him he was charming he was good looking as far as some people could tell as well as well behaved so everybody thought that this child was going far in life despite everything that he has endured in his life so while Ernest Mabaso was in grade 11, he joined a cycling club. The reason why Ernest Mabaso wanted to join a cycling club was because he wanted to be active. At this point in time, he was not particularly playing sports and there was no sports in his area because there were no recreational centers. Basically, it's a township that is neglected by the government, particularly when it comes to sporting facilities. So he, for some reason, he fell in love with cycling and so he went and got himself into a cycling club. In that cycling club, it is said that Ernest was also a high performer. He was thriving and winning races. So at this point in time, you and I are feeling, yes, finally, he has some peace of mind. Uh, finally, he is happy. He's being a teenager and he's enjoying his childhood or the last few years of his childhood. Sooner, he's going to be headed to university where he's going to study to become whatever he wants to be and then become a successful contributing member of society. So one morning, as per usual, Ernest Mabaso gets out of bed, prepares himself for school, eat breakfast with other orphanage, hop on the bus and, and heads to school. But when he gets to school, he does something really bizarre. He goes straight to the principal's office and announces to the principal that today was his last day at school because he has won a scholarship to New York to study medicine. This is bizarre because Ernest is in 11th grade and when you are in 11th grade, there is no way that you would be getting a scholarship to college, let alone to a medical school. Here in South Africa, you can only get scholarships when you have reached the senior year or what we call here in South Africa, metric. And if you show any prospects of being an A student or a great performer, then you can start applying for scholarships, bursaries, as well as other financial aids that you will have to use when you get to college. So it was strange that at grade 11, Ernest Mabaso had already gotten a scholarship to study in New York. So the principal of the school did not necessarily buy Ernest's story. What he did was he did his own investigation. He called the Department of Education to check if there was any scholarship offer for students in Cape Town or anywhere else in South Africa. The Department of Education was like, what are you talking about? There's no such a thing, especially for a grade 11 student. So the principal then did not necessarily push further with his investigation. He just left it like that. And Ernest Mabaso basically dropped out of school. He was few weeks away from writing his final exam before he moved to matric, meaning that he was left with one more year to finish high school, but he decided to drop out. So that would be the last time Ernest Mabaso has set foot in school, let alone with education. So every single morning he would get up with the rest of the orphanage and wander around in town during school hours. So basically the orphanage thought he was still at school when in fact he had dropped out and he was just wandering on the streets of Cape Town. And the part that gets me is that Ernest is a great performer at school. He's basically an A student and yet he decided to drop out. He was not struggling with any subject at school. He was not being bullied. Basically, he was almost popular because he was well liked. So why did he drop out? Nobody knows. 
So the following year, Ernest Mabaso turns 18, and unfortunately for him, the policy of the orphanage is that when an orphan turns 18, they will have to leave the orphanage and basically go out into the big, bad, ugly world and be independent. So when Ernest Mabaso reached the age of majority, then he was forced out of the orphanage and then he started wondering what would be my next step because I need to survive, I need to have shelter, I need to have clothes, I need to do things that I want to do. So he started thinking and while he was being forced out of the orphanage, one of the social workers that worked at the orphanage felt really bad for Ernest and decided to have a chat with her husband, asked him if uh, he could allow Ernest to come and live with them while he tries to find his feet. And the husband uh, fortunately agreed and said, okay, fine, he can come and live with us until he is uh, fit enough to go out there and be independent. And indeed, the social worker took Ernest in uh, with her husband and he lived there for a couple of days, or I think about four or five days, when one morning when the couple woke up to prepare for work and when they went into the garage, uh, they found their car gone. Uh, basically, Ernest has stolen the car, stolen some valuables in the house. Uh, he went into the husband's wallet and stole some money and also some jewelries and other things that he was going to survive on while he was on the run. He basically was on the run and he was headed to Johannesburg. Remember, Ernest Mabaso is very intelligent. So when he stole the car, he basically disappeared. He was off the grid. No one knew where exactly did he go to and there are no signs of him driving off with the stolen car anywhere to Johannesburg through toll plazas and things of that nature. I'm supposing he was using old roads that led to Johannesburg where he was not going to be detected. So for two years, Ennis Mabaso was under the radar until one day he decided to join social media. So he opened a Facebook account and he decided not to use his real name, but he used a fake name by the name of Sibusi Sokoza. So now this is 2017 when he opens a Facebook account and he calls himself Sibusi Sokoza on his Facebook account. So he started inviting random people to follow him and he would also follow random people for goodness knows what, what he was planning because he was on the plan. So one day while he was busy following people and also inviting people to follow him, to follow him, he hits a jackpot basically. A lady by the name of Mbali Koza actually accepted his friend request and they started chatting. So a few days after Mbali has accepted his friend request on Facebook, Ernest Mabaso, who is now Smusi Sokoza, guys, it's gonna get, I'm going to jump between Smusi Sokoza and Ernest now and again. If I say Smusi so you must know I'm speaking about Ernest. When I say Ernest, I'm talking about Smusi so because they are one and the same person. One is fake, one is real. So anyways, Smusiso then started chatting up Mbali Koza and one of the things that Smusiso tells Mbali is that he is her cousin. And then the, uh, and Mbali was like, you are my cousin, how so? That is when he started telling Mbali about his father. He said, my father, his name is Mandla Koza. Now, the coincidence in this story that he was telling Mbali Koza was that Mbali indeed had an uncle by the name of Mandla. And the funny part about Mandla Koza, he's late, he passed on. He was a womanizer. Basically, he had children absolutely everywhere. And it's not a surprise that one of his child will resurface and wants to reunite with the cause of family. So Mbali had no reason to doubt what Sibusiso, which is Ernest, was telling her. And in fact, Mbali decided to tell the entire family about the long lost cousin of theirs. The one person that she felt needed to know the story was her own mother, Toro Koza, 
who was living in KwaZulu Natal, a city called Peter Marysburg. I'm going to abbreviate it by saying PMB during the story. So, uh, Toro Koza back in PMB was elated. She could not wait to meet her nephew, her brother's son. Mbadi Koza herself told her sister, whom she lived with by the name of Gugu Koza, that hey, I just found a long lost cousin of ours on Facebook. Dudu Koza herself was elated by the news and they could not wait to meet their cousin brother. Now Mbali and Dudu lived in Johannesburg in a house in a township called Flakfontein. Now Dudu and Mbali being sisters, they lived in Mbali's house with their children. Mbali had three children and Dudu had two children, making five of them, two with the two ladies, but Mbali lived also with her boyfriend by the name of Pizza Cooper. So the entire household had eight people living in it. So Mbali and her long lost cousin brother would chat for days on Facebook. They would sleep late at night, basically trying to get to know each other and gain each other's trust. So back in KwaZulu Natal KZN, Mbali's mother, Toko Koza, could not wait to meet her long lost nephew. So she decided to tell Mbali to come with Smusiso to her house in Peter Marysburg so that she could meet this long lost nephew of hers. So Mbali, Dudu, and the rest of the children packed up and they went to Peter Marysburg. They drove a good six and a half hours so Mbali organized everything. She even called other extended family members to come and meet Musiso, Mandla's long lost son. Mind you, all this is happening in less than a month since Musiso and Mbali met each other on Facebook. Finally, Mbali, Dudu, Smusiso and the children arrive in Peter Marysburg and they are greeted by a sea of people. These people that were at Mbali's home were all Koza family members. So I feel like I need to explain this part because it involves culture and tradition of the Zulus. I'm a Zulu myself and I have also once been a long lost son. Uh, to my father because of things that happened while we were growing up and the, my parents split up. So basically in the Zulu culture, when a child is found or a long lost uh, family member returns home, basically what will happen is if you are an animal lover and you do not like the part that I'm going to say, please fast forward the video a little bit because it involves slaughter of animals. So basically, in the Zulu culture, they will either slaughter a sheep or a goat. Usually it's a goat because we believe that a goat is closest to our ancestors and basically it uh, connects us to the ancestors real quicker. And as well, the gall of the goat, it is where our ancestors basically communicate with us. So a goat was slaughtered for Smusi. So basically to get uh, licked by the ancestors of the Kosa and as a result he would officially be a Kosa. So that's exactly what happened when he arrived in Peter Marysburg. Uh, a goat was slaughtered together with some chickens. The gall of the goat was then uh, dripped on his feet as well as on his um, top of his skull and he was officially a member of the Kosa family and welcomed as a long lost son of the Kosas. Yeah, same thing happened to me as well when I was reunited with my father's family. So I kind of like understand this part. So back to uh, when everything started settling down, uh, Ernest started feeling, uh, Smusiso feeling at home and warmly welcomed. All the Kosa family members fell in love with Smusiso because Smusiso did not behave like a visitor. He did not behave as if, as if he was somebody who needs to be treated special. He became part and parcel of the family. Now, some parts of Peter Marysburg are still undeveloped, so you have to go fetch water somewhere else. There was no clean running water in the yard or in the house, so you had to like carry buckets to go and fetch water. Smusiso 
did not was not even asked he would take a bucket and go and fetch water he would clean dishes he would wash clothes he would sweep he would basically clean after himself as well as everyone else everybody was impressed by this they were like this child has a good head on his shoulders he was raised very well by his mother so they had no reason to doubt him they had no reason to question anything about this young man they were impressed so impressed because Smusiso, when they were getting to know him he decided to tell a fib he told the family particularly his aunt that he's actually a medical doctor and that he just returned from New York because he has studied at New York School of Medicine. So I had to quickly check if School of New York School of Medicine existed and lo and behold, it does exist, but it is called Crossman Medical School. It's based in the University of New York. So I was like, okay, pretty, he knows that much. That's cool, that means he always wants to be a doctor and he always wants to go study medicine at the New York University. I mean, I've always wanted to study law at Harvard. So I think if I had to tell a lie, I would say, oh, I went to Harvard School of Law or law school, whatever you call it. So he decided to say New York uh, Medical School and he has a degree from there. But he also studied medicine at the University of Cape Town that does exist <laughs> i just want you that you know because now we are learning that smusiso or ernest he's a pathological liar upon hearing this amazing news the family just melted with love for for smusiso because they for for the first time the cosa family has a doctor so that means he is not just well behaved he is not just a gentleman but he's also clever he's educated not just here in south africa but overseas as well so his status in the family was pretty high however ernest which is busy so also dropped a bomb and told the family that he is currently unemployed but he is looking for a job and he believes that he's going to find a job at Johannesburg General Hospital. So yes, Johannesburg General Hospital does exist. I've been there a couple of times, not for me, but my mom and other people in my family that have gone to that hospital. However, the hospital now is called a different name, Charlotte Makaike. Yeah, it's, you need to have the sound in order for you to pronounce it i still call it johannesburg jan or joburg jan i've never cared for the new name but anyways he wanted uh, a job he said he's going to get a job there uh at some point in his life and then he turned around and told his aunt because he looked at the situation saw the house that they lived in especially in the area that they lived in because it was undeveloped by the government and he told his aunt that one day i'm going to build you a beautiful big house when i get a job of course talk of course i was like oh my god this is a blessing to me thank you brother for this beautiful child indeed she did later say that musiso came to her as a blessing so once the dust started settling Togo Koza then, then turned to Dudu as well as Mbali and said to them I think you need to take in this Busiso into the house in Flakfontein so Mbali and Dudu did not object to that they felt that indeed it was going to be their responsibility to make sure that Busiso was comfortable as well as taken care of so they packed up their things and uh, Toko Koza then bought Smusiso a bus ticket back to Johannesburg. Remember, he's unemployed. And so Toko Koza felt that it was her responsibility to, uh, to buy Smusiso the bus ticket back to Johannesburg. So as probably planned by Smusiso or Ernest, everything was falling into place. Everybody was loving him, everybody just believed everything he told them. And yeah, it was like abracadabra and boom, magic happened. 
and so they arrived in flap fontaine and now instead of being eight people it was now nine people that lived in that house but one thing about the house that Dudu as well as Mbali were sharing, they were extending it because of the, ch the, num the number of children that they had. They wanted the children to have their own bedrooms. They also wanted privacy uh, with the people when they bring, I think, boyfriends, I suppose, have their own bedrooms and also have a bedroom or a guest room in the house and so when uh Spusiso came to the house it practically kind of got everybody crammed up into that one house so when Spusiso settled in in Flakfontaine once again like the charmer he is everybody just fell in love with him he was respectful to neighbors he was respectful to elders he would greet everybody he treated everyone equally despite having a medical degree that everybody knew about people felt that he was so humble he was so nice he was handsome and of course he was popular as well in the area and he's just been there for less than a month and he already has everybody in the palm of his hand and so he was basically enjoying life every single morning he would wake up and go and seek for work at johannesburg general hospital as well as other private clinics around johannesburg you and i know what he's doing he's doing exactly what he did when he lived in cape town and dropped out of high school just wandering around in the city streets so Mbali, Smusiso's cousin's sister, also made it her mission that she would help Smusiso find a job with either a local clinic or a hospital. So she would cut out classified advertisements about a position in a certain hospital. So one day, uh, Smusiso felt a little bit annoyed by Mbali doing this. So he ended up telling her to please stop doing this. He wants a, a specific job and the job that he wants, he wants it a job again. So any other job he's not interested in. So he basically shut Mbali down and Mbali understood she did not suspect anything. She, don't, she did not argue. She just felt that it is what he wanted and if this is what he wants, then she should respect it. So she stopped looking for a job on his behalf because Mbali would even speak to people that knew other people who worked at the hospital, either as a nurse or a doctor, just making sure that they look out for a, a vacancy and then some people would get back to Mbali and then Mbali would go to him and say, hey, there's a vacancy at this hospital. They are looking for a doctor. So I think you should apply. So eventually one day a, vac a vacant did open at Johannesburg Hospital. But at this point in time, Mbali was no longer uh, participating in looking for a job on his behalf. So she kept this uh, vacant. She kept this vacant to herself, unfortunately, because she was afraid of annoying her cousin brother. So it's been three months since Busiso moved in a uh, flat contained house when Mbali and Dudu, the children and the Kupe, when suddenly the house goes quiet. The neighbors and people that knew Mbali and Dudu were not seeing them for a couple of days now and they, they asked Smusiso, hey, I have not seen Mbali or Dudu or the children in a while. Where have they gone to? And then Smusiso would tell them that, oh, they had an unfortunate event happening in the family in Cape Town. So they had to go and attend to that problem. So the neighbors then would believe whatever Smusiso told them uh, that they had a family issue that was a family crisis in Cape Town. Some people didn't even know that the Kosa sisters had family in Cape Town. So anyways, they brushed it off and they went about with their own lives. <laughs> Strangely enough, Ernest or Smusiso, being Dudu and Bali's cousin brother, he too should have gone to this family crisis. But instead, the neighbors as well as the people around Flakfontein were only seeing Ernest Smusiso entering the house he was basically in and out of the house every single day he's the only person that they could see and they did not uh, suspect absolutely anything so remember i told you that mbali and dudu were extending their house so there was a heap of sand that was at the gates that was 
delivered by a truck prior to going to uh, Peter Marysburg to introduce Musiso to the family. So one of the days uh, people were seeing Musiso carrying sand in a wheelbarrow into the house. So he would carry the heap of sand in a wheelbarrow into the house. One of the days the neighbor asked him, hey, what are you doing? He said, oh no, as you can see, they are extending the house so while they are gone i'm just basically helping out i'm just helping out leveling the floors in the house so of course it makes sense because they are extending the house and so they had no reason to doubt him whatsoever now the reason why smusiso ernest was taking sand from outside into the house was because there was a stench in the house he did not think as a medical doctor that when you kill people, few days down the line, they're gonna start decomposing. And when they decompose, they give out a stench. So now he was being overwhelmed with the stench of decomposing bodies of seven people. That is Mbali, her sister Dudu, and their five children. That is what Smusiso did to them. He killed them. But before he killed them, he raped some of the children as well as one of the adults. So the smell would get more and more and more intense, so much so that even the neighbors started complaining about a foul smell that was coming from the Kosa family. And uh, Smusiso would give an excuse about, oh, he, the fridge was not working and all the meat in the fridge basically got off and that is why it's giving out this terrible smell. So he continued to bring in the sand and he would basically cover the bodies with the sand uh, that was bringing from the outside into the house. So what, he would do that every single day. One day he just felt sick of it and then he started calling kids around Flakfontein to help him to carry the sand into the house. So at this point, all the bodies were already covered so one of the older kids asked Smusiso, what's the sand for what is it that we are covering he will say no 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 just bring the sand in at the later stage i'm going to level the floor that is exactly what i'm doing but one of the kids the older kids was like there's a smell that is just horrible that is in this house what is it and he's like nah while he was digging the floor uh, a, a, a pipe burst and now he's trying to also cover that up so the kids are kids they're not going to ask too many questions they don't know anything about dead bodies that the dead body actually does decompose and smell exactly like that so they continue to help him so now one of the things that Musiso did not count on is that Mbali was always active on her WhatsApp. So she always had a WhatsApp conversation with another cousin sister of hers that lived that lived in KwaZulu Natal. And so the cousin has not heard from Mbali in little over a week. So she would call Mbali's phone, but the Mbali, but Mbali's phone would be off. But because Mbali lived with her other sister, Dudu, so the cousin sister will call Dudu's phone and she would also find it off. So one day, Smusiso decided to switch on Mbali's phone and then he saw messages coming from the cousin sister that lived in KwaZulu Natal. And so Smusiso decided to respond to the message and said, um, Mbali and Dudu are not around. She forgot her phone at home they had to run to uh, sort out a family crisis in Cape Town. So the cousin sister was like, okay, what family crisis is this? I'm part of the family. I would have known about this crisis. Then Smoothie sister was like, well, that's all that I know. And he switched the phone back off. So the cousin sister worried about what she just heard as well as confused that we have cousins in Cape Town. So she went to Mbali's mother, Togo, in Peter Marysburg and say, hey auntie, tell me something. What family crisis are we in and why are those people in Cape Town? And Mbali's mother was like, what are you talking about? We don't have a family crisis in our family. And definitely the causas don't have family members in Cape Town. And that is when the cousin relayed the story 
to talk a cause and told her that actually I was told by your newly found nephew that Mbali and Dudu and the children had gone to Cape Town to a family crisis. And that is when they started to be like, no. Togo bought a bus ticket for the cousin sister and told her to go straight to the Flakfontein house and find out what exactly is going on. The cousin sister wasted no time, hopped on the bus, arrived the following morning at Flakfontein, went to the house, but the front gate was locked. And so she jumped over and went to knock on the door. Just before she got to the door, she was greeted by a swarm of flies. Is it a swarm of flies or swarm? Okay, I know it's a swarm of bees. What is a group of flies? Swarm, right? Okay, whatever. Please do comment down below and correct me. Anyways, she was greeted by a swarm of flies as well as this stench that was unbearable so she decided to peep through the window and see what is going on inside unfortunately the window from the inside was covered in flies so she was like okay i'm not sure what's going on she went to the neighbor to ask if they have seen bali and dudu and the neighbor was like oh we thought she was with you guys because Sibusiso told us that uh, the girls and the children have gone to Cape Town for a family crisis. So what are you talking about? And then the cousin sister tells the neighbor, no, we don't have a family crisis too. We don't have family members in Cape Town. And so both the neighbor and, uh, and the cousin started getting worried, but the cousin sister wasted no time. She called the police. She called the police because she wanted to avoid two things. Number one, she wanted to avoid breaking the law in case breaking into a house was against the law. The second thing, she wanted the police to help her break in because she doesn't have the tools to do so. The police, surprisingly, wasted no time. Within minutes, they were there. And when they went to the Cosa house, they were greeted with a familiar smell. A familiar smell that they have gotten before due to the, the job that they do and they turn around and tell the cousin sister that mm, we're not quite sure how to tell you this but the smell that is coming from the house is of dead human body the cousins like what are you talking about they then call the coroner the coroner did come also before even breaking into the house confirmed to the police as well as the cousin sister that indeed what's smelling on the other side is dead bodies of human beings so indeed the police broke down the door of the house and inside the house they find heaps and heaps of of sand and the coroner was like those are dead bodies so the police and and the coroner and all the people that are involved in the forensics started digging out or ex excavating out the bodies and indeed there they were all seven of them that is mbali dudu the children which is five children i can just imagine what was going through the cousin sister's head like what on earth just happened at this point in time the police now started wanting to know what on earth just happened who lived here apart from these seven people that are lying dead then the neighbors was like oh well the girls they lived with two men one of the men was the boyfriend of um bali his name is fita Kupe, and the other man is their cousin brother Smusiso Koza. and uh so the police want to know where they are then some of the people in the neighborhood were like well fita cooper always comes in and out of the house in the morning he goes to work he comes back in the evening around 9 30 pm smoothie sokoza will also leave in the morning come back because he's seeking for a job in johannesburg so for the neighbors everything started falling into place one plus one did become two because all the stories that smoothie was telling them were just not making sense it's just that they did not care enough to dig further and find out what exactly you're talking about. We don't know that the Cosa girls had family in Cape Town or call somebody who might know about these girls and basically look for them. So 
everybody was like dumbfounded by the information and also looking at the bodies of these seven people that they once knew as neighbors. The interesting and disturbing part about this story is that people in the township told the police that uh, Fitzer Cooper was seen in and out of the house. He would leave in the morning to work and he would come back in the evening. So some people were like, how is it possible that he would not have known that Mbali, Dudu and the children have been murdered, yet there was this unbearable stench of uh, decomposing flesh in the house. He is definitely involved or he knows something. That's what the neighbors were telling the police. The police themselves were like, yeah, but we still need to find him so that he can answer these questions that we want to know from him because there's no way that seven people are lying dead for several for several days and he would not have known about it and yet he was coming in and out of the house because this story became national news everybody were like what okay we've heard all sorts of heinous crimes in this country but this one definitely takes the cup and uh so basically let me read what the police said to the news uh people to the journalist they have the suspect and it's a person known by the family and he has been staying with the family for the past three months now he wormed his way into the family that he was a child of the late brother to the two deceased ladies so at this point i'm supposing uh the police ended up talking to Togo Koza, which is Mbali's mother, to find out about the other gentleman, which is Busizo Koza. And uh, the Togo Koza basically told the police the entire story that he just popped up from nowhere and he claimed that he was the son of his late, of her late brother, Mandla, who obviously was a womanizer and he had children absolutely everywhere and they did not doubt anything that he had told them about um, the story that you told them because it was just too coincidental that uh, Smusiso or Ernest would know that this particular cause of family had a uncle or a brother by the name of Mandla Koza. So Smusiso Koza was officially a person of interest to the South African police service. The police further revealed to the news or to, to the journalists that they suspect that Ernest Vusi Mabaso, which is his real name, is actually a Zimbabwean national. Though he claims that he's South African and that his surname is Koza. However, the police found that the information about Ernest is contradicting. So he is not who he say he is. His real name is Ernest Vusi Mabaso and they believe that he's a Zimbabwean national. So this is the same rumor that was going uh, was going on when he was back in Cape Town, where people were saying, actually, this family, they are not South Africans, they are Zimbabweans. So the police basically confirmed that, indeed, he was not South African, but a Zimbabwean national. In the Eastern Cape, which is another province of South Africa, which is about 700 to 800 kilometers away from Johannesburg, an arrest is made there and it is a stolen car and the occupant or the thief or the hijacker you guessed it it is ernest mabaso so the johannesburg police had put out an apb as well as be on the lookout bolo across the country and the police in eastern cape recognized the face and then he was extradited to johannesburg to face the charges of seven murder and when he arrived in Johannesburg he was arrested read his rights and then he was taken to a jail cell where he was interviewed by the police and uh, Ernest Mabaso wasted no time he started confessing however his confession was bizarre to say the least and this is what he confesses to the police he says that he was living his merry life in Cape Town when one day a man by the name of Peter Cooper and some gentlemen kidnapped him, brought him to Johannesburg, 
But while they were driving back to Johannesburg, Fitzer Cooper told Ernest information about the Causa family, that the Causa family had an uncle who was a womanizer and had many children. You are going to assume a name of Smusiso Causa, the long lost son of Mandla Causa. And this is the story you're going to get Mbali and Dudu to trust you with. Now, the whole point of kidnapping him and the whole point of telling him this story is because Fita Cooper wanted Mbali and the entire family killed so that he can inherit the house when once Mbali and Dudu and the children were dead. So the police felt that, okay, the story sounds plausible, but they still need to, con they still have to confirm it by arresting Fita Cooper. Fitzer Cooper found out that the police were looking for him. He decided to flee. He was caught at the border gate between South Africa and Zimbabwe. I don't think that actually helped him because now he seems to be confirming what Ernest Mabaso was telling the police. So he was arrested, read his rights, and he was brought back to Johannesburg. In Johannesburg, when he was being interviewed or interrogated, he said that when he came back home one day, he found Smusiso in the house and told him that, listen, the girls are gone with the kids to Cape Town. And then they said, you should not be living here for a while until they are back. Because apparently when they came back, there were some things that were missing and did not trust you anymore. So he did not want to argue. He then left and he went to stay with an, an another girlfriend apparently. And so he was not coming to the house at all. All that those people were saying were lies. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe people already, I don't know, programmed that Fitzer Cooper will come out of the house at this point and he'll come back from work because it was something that he did every single day. So maybe people thought they saw him in the morning. They also thought they saw him in the evening coming back from work. Nobody knows. But he says he never came back to the house. And definitely if uh, the girls were murdered, he would have reported them murdered, especially if there was an odor that was coming from underground of the house, he would definitely would have investigated. And if he found dead bodies, he was definitely going to report the dead bodies. And obviously the pin was going to go on Smusiso having done the murder, if it was Smusiso who had done the murders. So this is where the story gets really bizarre and upsetting for me because it robs the Causa family, especially Togo Causa, justice. Oh, by the way, the police did believe the plausibility of Ernest Mabaso's story about Fita Cooper. So in 2019, the trial for Ernest Vusi Mabaso as well as Fita Cooper was to start. They tried to apply for bail, but bail was denied by the magistrates on two reasons. The first reason was to protect them from the community who were paying for their blood. Secondly, they were a flight risk. Remember, Cooper was uh, caught in Bait Bridge and uh, Ernest Mabaso was, was caught in the Eastern Cape. So meaning they were not trusted that they were going to return to court for their trial. So the bail applications were denied. So in January of 2019, when the police went to Ernest Vusi Mabaso's cell to collect him for his trial, they found him hanging from the rafters of his cell. He had committed suicide. Unfortunately, because of the suicide, the state felt that the case was weak and they had no prospect of winning and securing a conviction if they prosecuted Fita Cooper for the murder of um, Bali, Dudu, and the five children. They said that due to Ernest committing suicide, who implicated Fita Cooper, then they have no case against him. So as a result, the court acquitted Fita Cooper and he was released. He basically walked free. And this is the part where I say this is tragic for the family of the Causas, especially Togo Causa, who lost two of her daughters and five grandchildren. And nobody, 
nobody is going to go to jail for this. Nobody is going to be prosecuted. Nobody is going to be convicted. No justice for her and her children that were brutally murdered. We don't know how they were killed. The police, another reason why the police believed uh, Ernest that Fita Cooper was involved in the murder, basically Fita Cooper was the allergic mastermind. They said that it was impossible that one person would have managed to kill seven people by himself. So definitely he had help because if he was alone, some family members would have managed to escape and report the crime. So it's impossible that he acted alone. So he definitely was working with someone. So now that he had committed suicide and had implicated Fitzer Cooper and he's dead, there's no case. So Ernest Mabaso did not rob the Cosa family of their children and grandchildren, but he also robbed them of justice. Well, thank you so much for watching my true crime story today. Please, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe and make sure to click the bell notification so that you get notified every time I dropped a new video. And don't forget to also leave a comment down below and let me know what you think of this bizarre story. And definitely don't forget to share this video far and wide because guys, these activities help my channel with the YouTube algorithm to grow my channel. And I will see you next time with a new video because it's getting dark right now. Goodbye.